I'm going to cover insects that are in problems in San Diego, but also some things that you might want to look forward to that we're getting in our interception programs. Um, I don't know. We get, uh, you know that there's a multi-billion dollar nursery industry here in San Diego, and we have a, uh, the agriculture department is always inspecting plants that are coming in from Florida and Hawaii, which are considered our high risk locations for bringing new pests to California. And that is because, why is that? Because every three months we get a new pest in California from Florida, Hawaii. Um, and so we're, we're trying, we're pushing back the tide. It is, it is sometimes really feels discouraging. Um, but luckily we have managed to keep fruit flies out of California. But every time you turn, there's a new pest taking toehold. So I, we're going to depend on you to become familiar with what's normal in your landscape. And I cannot cover everything, but I'm just going to go through some of the things that uh, you will see and or you might see. Whoops. OK. Uh, people brought in some golden rain tree. And this is not a problem for you guys. Um, they eat the seed pods of the golden rain tree, but then they're a nuisance because they gather in groups. They'll, they have the red shoulder right there. They're also called the red shouldered bug. And they get mixed up with all the other black and, black and red bugs. <laughs> um, but really, the reason why they're a problem is because they develop in mass on the seed pods of the golden rain tree, and then they come to your front door. Hi, we're here. Um, and they like to cling together because, of course, that's where they mate and reproduce, so they have to come together. So people call a lot, and they think they're going to die because they got Jadera bug, but it's not a big deal. Okay. Now, olive psyllid is another problem. Has everybody seen olive psyllid infestations? No. Okay, well, if you're looking at olive and you're looking at some new, newer stems, you will see some white fluffy stuff as indicative of often pests, cottony material. And um, this is the psyllid here. It's a little guy about two millimeters, and these, it looks a lot like white flies, okay? And it really does look like a white fly infestation. And this was a new, this is a new bug as of um, about six years ago. And has everybody seen the tipu, tipuana tipu psyllid? It's a beautiful creature. Um, <coughs> lovely little guy, really fun to look at. And it is causing a big nuisance for uh, cars parked under the trees in parking lots where the honeydew is copious. And a lot of tipus have had to be trimmed and otherwise cut back. Um, it's tipu is such a great tree. It's really a really a drag that it got infested with this. And this was again about six years ago that it came in. So when people call and say, I don't know what is getting all over my car. It's just sticky. And you go, well, where are you parking during the day? Well, I'm under a eucalyptus tree or I'm under a tipus tree or, you know. So this is what you need to look for. Um, Tracy, yes. is there any control for that? Is there any control for it? Anything you can do? All of these um, homotrins can be taken care of with uh, pruning and a systemic insecticide. If you would like to so desire. <laughs> Um, but some of these are under development, too. I mean, you don't know how to control them. If you're going biological control, of course, it would be to control ants, have pruning, good aeration, a lot of uh, let the, the, the trees don't have, uh, you know, 
real pockets of moisture where the branches are touching and you've got to let the air come in and dry out, uh, dry out the pest because like I said, moisture is one of the main things that, that is the, going to destroy your insects. So if you set it up so there's less moisture and aeration through the leaf canopy, you'll probably have less pests and control the ants. But if, if you're desperate and you found tried everything and block, can't work it out, well then of course Pat would say you planted the tree in the wrong place. But uh, then a systemic would work. But if you know that wouldn't be my first choice. My first point choice would be pruning. But in a in a situation like we are with moving plants around, we have to control it. So we have to tell the grower that they need to control it right away before it's shipped out. But if it's in a landscape, they can work with it. Now, California red scale, um, this is very common on fruit, but it attacks a whole bunch of different types of pests. So don't be surprised if you see it on other landscape ornamentals. It's, um, it's got a lot of parasitoids out there. So if you control the ants, California red scale should come under control. The University of Riverside has left, you know, done a ton of releases on different parasites on this. Citrus leaf miner, as I just said, um, a lot of the people will be coming in for the first time. That came in about eight years ago. A lot of people come in and say, my citrus tree is dying. I don't know what it is. And now we're having the extra problem of citrus, um, Asian citrus psyllid mixing in with the citrus leaf miner and mixing in with the aphids. Um, citrus leaf miner uh, has uh, only been a problem in young developing trees. Otherwise, you can handle the the the, um, the damage in older established trees. If you don't like it, you can try the citrus leaf miner traps and. Uh, they don't seem to be impacted by whether there's ants or not. But it's very complicated unless you take a close look. Like I said, that leaf curling could be aphids, citrus leaf miner, or Asian citrus psyllid. But you'll get a lot of calls on citrus leaf miner. Um, aloe mites, we have occasional uh, reason to see aloe, if you see any disfiguration in aloe of this type, there is a, called an aerophyid mite, which doesn't look like a regular mite. It, it looks like a little tube. And um, on when you get these aerophyid mites, for some reason, other mites come in too. So you'll, you'll get like a red mite. Once the plant gets going, the, the whole community of mites start infesting it. Um, so be on the lookout for aloe mites. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I think IPM recommends pruning, just completely taking off any disfigured, um, select a captured succulent, throw it. Just, yeah, when, when, usually when we get samples of aloe mite, it comes off of the shoots often starting in succulents and they'll get kind of a that weird bulbousy thing on the top. And if you cut that off, if you find it right away before it gets down into kind of the main part of the succulent, then um, you most likely can save it. But I guess I think the only control measure is, is recommended by IPM for me. That's that's a good good uh, thing to know, Leah, because it kind of makes sense because the aerophyid mites only found on the disfigured tissue, but the other mites still might be on the other tissue. So, um, but then you could prune and then follow up with maybe a soap or something like that. Do they only attack animals? Yes. A lot of the insects we talk about, unless I say it's polypagus, usually it's an insect per plant. Very, very specific. Very specific. Tracy, yes. um, I was talking to Jim Bethy about the owl a couple months ago, and it sounded like that there's a there is a nematode that's oh, really? that beneficial, but it's really for the homeowner. 
it's not cost effective. Um, okay. it's, it's extremely expensive. Uh, and we have to see if we're in that situation. Good. Uh, work the, yeah. The so that's good. And that's why I, I'm stumped when you ask me about control. That's really, you guys have Jim Bethke over there. And, and the university is what develops all the control measures. Um, so it's hard for me to answer a lot of it because I just go right to the university when I want control measures. Would we ever recommend on that one that you they need to just ditch it? Destroy, destruction, one of my favorite methods. <laughs> <laughs> Really, because you know, you don't. It, there's certain things that are just <coughs> characteristic of either a bad, you know, a bad drain, unless you're very attached to this particular kind of aloe, or if it's rare, or something like that, where you have reason to keep it. But there is something wrong with that plant that it's so vulnerable. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, as a you know, practical kind of gardener, but that's your call, totally. <laughs> Yes. It'd be helpful if, as you go through your list of insects, if you identify those that would be native to California, that would say were here hundreds of years ago, compared to those that are exotics that have been imported somewhere along the way. Yes, I'm trying to address that. And um, if you go through here, um, all of these are introduced. Okay? So we have uh, Golden Rain Tree was introduced about. Eight years ago, olive psyllid six years ago, tipu psyllid about eight years ago, California red scale about a hundred years ago. That's why there's so many pred predators and parasites in there. So what what was nature's IPM 200 years ago? Obviously, the the, predator, the insects don't usually kill the host. So what would be the natural cycle that the that the insects would breed in such a way that they would not destroy their hosts? Is that is it? Well, the problem is, is that you know, since we've brought so many characters into the into this area without their natural predators, and that's the whole thought behind biological control programs and inundative releases and establishment of predators and parasites that they go hunting for the the native predator in. Uh, like for Asian citrus psyllid, they went to a part of Pakistan to get, Dr. Hama went to Pakistan to get a little um, parasitory, or a parasite of the Asian citrus psyllid eggs. So what happens is we bring the plant first, and generally speaking, we hope that it doesn't have any pests with us, with it. Then later, eventually, the pest comes in a suitcase or something like that on a sprig that somebody brings with them from, you know, Australia. So the pest gets established, and then sometimes the native beneficials can take care of it, but sometimes we need to go extra step and bring over a, a, a parasite. But always in common with all of these new introductions is that there's almost like a fire line. The first time it comes through, it's the worst. And you see that the, the, there is always a beneficial that catches up with it or a balance that catches up with it. It's really the first few years of its infestation that it is the worst and most noticeable, and then it kind of gets into balance. I guess what I'm trying to work towards is if if we only had the native California insects, there would be some balance in nature, whether it be life cycle or predation that would keep them under control. So the vast majority of our problem relates to the exotics that have been imported where there is no predator or life cycle that would control it naturally. Is that kind of a well, fair assumption? Well, that's part of it, and then part of it is just um, uh, you know, any any um, undiverse area of crops also runs risk of having, um, you know, one animal eat, get too much, you know, be at a higher population okay. too. So it's diversity in the landscape as well as, um, you know, native versus not. There's 
you can, I, I believe that you can introduce and get a balance. That would mean in some agricultural crops, for example, you do have, it's an introduced crop and it's planted in monoculture and it is still not a problem to control the pests. So there are examples on the other extreme as well. So okay. you can never generalize it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, yes. Perhaps you already said this, but what I was going to say is, I think what a wildlife biologist would also add would be that um, the California natives also can become a problem as we destroy the habitat and build over it and put roads over it because the predators on um, those natives, whether they be reptiles or birds or other insects, their populations are down. So remember, it's an entire food web. So if we mess with the top of it, the insects, which are, of course, poised to take over the world, as all of you can tell you, also then become a problem. And sometimes, of course, we know that environments change naturally through yes. earthquake or flood or fire. So extinction is also a normal part of, yes. uh, of you know, evolution. But that's one reason why the California natives are also becoming more of a problem because we've destroyed the habitat in the area. And they evolved too, probably. Yeah. Responding to pesticides. Or yeah, but if you, open, if you do it so fast as through building, evolution doesn't have a chance to keep up. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and there's a lot of host jumping that things do that surprises us all the time, you know. Um, so California red <coughs> scale citrus leaf might only really introduce Al might, I'm not sure where this, how long this has been in California, or if it can't come with the aloe. Jerusalem cricket, a native. Somebody sent it in. Uh, one of your friends. Uh, do not let this creature grab hold of your finger. It has very strong mandibles meant to cut through roots and debris, oh. and it will give you a start. It's just a strong biter. Um, so you will see these if you move your pots around, or you know they'll be under in compost areas and whatnot. And kids love them, right, Nia? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it stinks. It stinks really bad. Oh, really? You're stink? Well, you know, I put them in the bag when he was alive, and I cooked him up, and he was trying to like, survive in there slowly. <laughs> Again, the cottony white, but you you see, don't underestimate what you might have on the outside of an agave with a little white cottony mass. Um, and what you have here is the mama mealybug here. That's her body, and these are all babies, all eggs right there. And and all of these little um, apical meristems are filled with the whole colonies of all those little agave mealybugs. They're little purplish guys with um, with the normal uh, uh, white waxy filaments around them. And we have two species that are becoming more of a problem in cultivated plants, and we don't know why. Uh, we don't even know if they're native, and they're not described. Um, there's Pseudococcus and Paracoccus, and there's debate on where they came from, how long they've been here, et cetera, et cetera. But you've got to keep an eye on your agaves. And it might just, who knows why they are as bad as they are. Um, now, aphid predators, we talked about aphid predators, and I just want to take a minute in talking about that balance between um, your, your pests and your predators. Now, you can do a lot to control aphids. Um, Somebody brought in a surfeit fly, which I did pin, but I forgot to bring Rogetta at lunch. 
Um, and it is a hunter. It lays its eggs. You have a picture of the larva outside on your bulletin board. It will be in amongst the aphids eating. You have a aphidian wasp, which is a tiny little wasp, a little black wasp that turns the aphids into mummies, which some of you brought in, mummies, <laughs> aphid mummies. Uh, you have ladybird beetles or mealybug destroyers that eat aphids. And you have a picture of the larvae out on the poster. Um, and there's an aphid midge uh, that's being released in greenhouses that also creates a little maggot that eats the, the aphids that you can buy from a greenhouse supply place. Now, the big thing about aphid predators is a lot of them need uh, extra coral nectaries or some other place to, to inhabit. And the big classic way that, that in pecans that they control aphids in the pecan trees is to plant an understory of vetch, which has a ton of aphids and, and flowers and extra floral nectaries. And they use that as an insectary for the ladybugs. And when the pecans have aphids, they crawl up and eat the aphids, and that's the way they balance the system. And so when you plant a garden, it is so important to have floral nectaries, not only for your bees and your native bees, your honeybees and your native bees, but also these predatory uh, wasps and flies that do a lot to uh, control your aphids. And again, ants are going to in interfere with all of these things. So um, think about your habitat and, and how you plant in beneficials. And sectaries, uh, insectary plants cannot be underestimated how important they are to having a, a good um, system. Um, now, a few of you brought in hemispherical scale, and that's a soft scale that has, uh, it, it's, I, I would like to think of it as when you look at it from the side, it's got, uh, it's a half circle. So, um, and it's, it can be, a, it's very polyphagous and it's been here a long, long time. And it has a lot of predators, but again, ants are number one, you know, contributor to this getting to be a problem. Black scale, several of you brought in black scale, it's another soft scale on olives, a whole bunch of different Crops been here for a long, long time. Um, Leah talked about glassy wing sharpshooter. Uh, a lot of our program is to not send glassy wing sharpshooter up north. <laughs> Every single plant that's shipped from San Diego County to Napa is inspected both at the origin here in San Diego and up in Napa. And even if we send, we send hundreds of thousands of plants to Napa, and uh, they, we are, our program is so excellent that we've all, they've only caught, I think in a couple of years, they haven't caught a single egg mass, and then in a couple of years, in the past couple of years, they've caught one or two egg masses. And so the inspectors are really, they love us uh, up, in, up in the wine country, because they don't want a glassy wing sharpshooter because it's such a good vector of Pierce's disease in, in grapes. So um, that is uh, one real area of concern and that's why we monitored using those yellow sticky traps to know what nurseries have problems with glassy wing sharpshooters so that we can monitor their populations and know when when we need to apply more pressure on getting control of it before we ship up. Yes? For houseplants, <clears throat> excuse me, that would commonly be attacked by scale or white fly or mealybugs, but don't, um, aren't near natural predators because they're inside. Does it make sense in this climate to take houseplants outside for a while so that those natural predators can do their work? I think so, absolutely. Mm -hmm. How long would you say a plant would need to be outside to give it a, a chance of attracting those predators? Well, given that you won't kill it by putting it out there, and you don't have any ants, 
if you can protect it from the sun. Um, probably, you know, a month. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, let's go for a break. So we're going to have a break, uh, 15 minutes.